In the summer of 1943, the Red Army, which had become strong enough to challenge the invader even without the help of winter, launched a new offensive. Since 1941, during the warm spring and summer months, the German army had been advancing and the Red Army had been retreating. Only when the winter blizzards began did the Red Army go on the counter-offensive. So when summer turned to autumn and the shaken German armies were still rolling back to the Polish border, a wave of optimism rose in England. Optimism even seeped into the classically built Norfolk House in London, where Cossack housed its planning organs. The Germans had already been driven out of Africa. They were heavily pressed in Italy. They were being hunted in the Atlantic. Now they were demoralized in Russia too. In short, Germany had lost the initiative everywhere. It seemed to some that Germany had already lost the war. No one was so convinced of the beginning of the end of Germany as the Allied airmen who were bombing German industrial centers day and night from British airfields. Bomber forces were no longer diverted to the Mediterranean, and the quantitative growth of strategic aviation in England was now in no way limited. Between January and September 1943, the American 8th Air Force nearly quadrupled from 225 heavy bombers to 881. As the total weight of the bombs being dropped increased, the skies over German industrial cities were increasingly filled with flames of conflagration. Most pilots were convinced that aviation would be able to undermine the enemy forces long before the forcing of the English Channel ground troops. However, the main task of the Allied air offensive that year was to destroy enemy fighters. In the spring of 1943, the German Air Force realized the danger of strategic bombing and hastened to respond to the threat by increasing fighter production. The Allied Air Command, fearing that the Germans would be able to dramatically increase fighter production and prevent Allied bombers from entering their airspace, concentrated their efforts against German aircraft factories. The bulk of these factories were located deep in Germany beyond the Rhine, out of range of Allied fighters, which could not escort bombers. Therefore, our day bombers were forced to break into the center of enemy country without cover. The curve of losses rose higher and higher. Only during one raid on a ball-bearing factory in Schweinfurt on 14 October, 60 bombers were shot down, B-17, which was 25% of the total number of aircraft involved in the raid. While we tried to reduce losses by using long-range fighters for escort, some air commanders still believed that the Allies would break Germany's backbone with aerial bombardment in a matter of months. I refrained from expressing my opinion on such claims of the Air Force commanders, for it was obvious to me that the estimate of the results of the aerial bombardments was very approximate and suffered from great inaccuracies. Subsequent inspection of reports on the results of bombing raids in the summer and autumn of 1943 showed the extent to which the Air Force had overestimated the effectiveness of its raids on German industrial facilities. However, this overestimation was not deliberate, as some critics have suggested, but was due to the difficulty of determining by aerial observation the extent of the damage inflicted. Air commanders underestimated the remarkable ability of German industry to rebuild after a bombing raid. Despite the misjudgment of the bombing results, however, it became increasingly apparent in the autumn of 1943 that Germany was beginning to feel the effects of the intensified heavy bomber offensive. Air reconnaissance files were increasingly filled with aerial photographs of destroyed German factories. Intelligence reports from Italy reported on the growing concern and fear of German soldiers at the front for the fate of their families in cities subjected to air raids. By November, a gap had formed in the German defence line in Russia near the Pinsk marshes. In the Crimea, the invaders were isolated, and in the devastated Ukraine, the Russians had taken Kiev, and the Germans were in danger of encirclement. By this time to us in England began to penetrate persistent rumours of growing discontent among those German generals who believed that Hitler's planned war on two fronts doomed Germany to disaster. If there were any sane men left anywhere in Germany, they had to realise that the only way to avert the inevitable catastrophe was immediate surrender. In London, Allied officers speculated about how deep the decay had gone, and many predicted that Germany would face the same collapse it had suffered in 1918. Although there was no reason for optimism in early 1943, Cossack made adequate plans in case Germany collapsed. With characteristic British thoroughness in military planning, Cossack outlined measures for three unlikely but still possible events. First, the collapse of the German Atlantic rampart. Second, a hasty German retreat to the Seed Fried Line, and third, 
the collapse and surrender of Germany. For each of these options, contingency plans were drawn up, known respectively by the conventional names, Rankin A, Rankin B, and Rankin C. If the collapse of the Atlantic Rampart or the retreat to the Siegfried Line did not remove Operation Overlord from the agenda in one form or another, the total collapse of Germany would mix up all the cards and force us to say goodbye to Operation Overlord. To prevent chaos on the continent, we had to throw all available forces into Europe, immediately cross the English Channel, invade Germany, disarm its troops and seize control of the country into our own hands. Thus, in November 1943, the First Army was not engaged in preparations for Operation Overlord, but in contingency planning for Operation Rankin C. In the event of German collapse in the autumn of 1943, the First Army was to commit ten American divisions to the immediate crossing of the English Channel, as troop strengths and the number of landing craft moving into England increased daily. The plan for Operation Rankin C had to be adjusted every week. In England it was autumn, the days were shortening, and in Germany there were no new signs that spoke of collapse. The optimism that had swept England in the autumn of 1943 soon disappeared. It did not reappear until a year later, when our columns rushed from the Seine to the unprotected German frontier. Until November 1943, no officer in London would have bet even two shillings that Germany was in danger of collapse. Though the rank in C plan was soon filed in the files, the time we had spent in compiling it had not been wasted. We developed the landing craft loading tables further and used them later during the invasion across the Channel. In the meantime, the newly established First Army headquarters had become a functioning machine and the planning officers were benefiting themselves by studying enemy troop dispositions and terrain. In November 1943, while Morgan's staff was sweating over the development of the plan for Operation Overlord, the Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee met in Cairo. There, the British and American Chiefs of Staff held a meeting before flying to Tehran to meet with Stalin. The British having set aside in Quebec, the demand of General Marshall to use resources only for the Operation Overlord in Cairo again sought to leave loopholes for themselves. In general, the British did not object to forcing the Channel, as they were literally up to their ears in the preparation of the invasion. But the British did not want to bind themselves to certain obligations, especially the appointment of a specific day of the invasion across the Channel. If the British agreed to set a specific date for the invasion, then they would have to give up all hope of carrying out a strategic diversion in the Mediterranean Sea. This is exactly what the British did not want. In November 1943, England had a choice of rich opportunities in the Mediterranean for politically advantageous campaigns. By this time, Clark, who was advancing on Rome, was stuck at Casino. Eisenhower needed reserves for a flank attack from the sea to keep the initiative in his own hands and to shackle more or less a significant portion of the enemy forces. An attempt by the British to seize several strongholds on the Dodecanese Islands failed and the landing troops were destroyed. The British claimed that in order to gain a foothold on these islands, they first needed to capture the island of Rhodes. They also argued that Turkey was taking a wait-and-see attitude for too long. If by a new allied offensive in the Mediterranean it were possible to draw Turkey into the war, then we would open a short supply route to Russia through the Dardanelles Strait. These suggestions were tempting, but they did not create much prospect to justify the refusal or postponement of an invasion across the Channel. The report of the American military attach in Moscow strengthened the position of those who were not particularly zealous in favour of an invasion across the Channel. The report indicated that the successes of the Red Army in the summer and autumn of 1943 might have led to a change in Russian opinion as to the desirability of an invasion in 1944. The Red Army, the report said, would probably prefer an immediate offensive even if limited to the Mediterranean theatre, to waiting for an invasion across the Channel. Only one man could say whether Operation Overload was necessary. The Joint Chiefs of Staff Committee travelled from Cairo to Tehran. Stalin immediately got down to business. After outlining Russia's strategy in fighting the German armies, he stated that after the defeat of Germany, the Soviet Union would go to war with Japan. Then, after assessing the fighting in Italy as not being of serious importance, Stalin declared that the obvious direction of the offensive was the northwest corner of France, across the English Channel. After that, the final decision was made. Thus, after two years of discussion, confusion, overtures and secondary operations, the invasion across the Channel became the main pivot of Allied strategy in the war in Europe.
Although the First Army had deployed its headquarters at Bristol as early as 16 October 1943, its role in planning the Channel invasion was still unclear. At that time, we did not yet know whether we would lead the invasion force or whether leadership would remain with the British. Cossack's original plan for the Channel invasion envisaged that the commander of the British Army would lead three first echelon divisions. Two British and one American. However, the American chiefs of staff rejected this plan. Devers proposed another plan. The invasion is carried out by the forces of two corps, which are directly subordinate to the Supreme Commander. Cossack, however, rejected this plan as impracticable. The US War Department tried to overcome the impasse by proposing a compromise plan, according to which three corps landed on the coast, the overall leadership of which was carried out by the commander of the American army, since there was only one American army in England, namely the first. This meant that the War Department had us in mind. Thus, according to the US War Department's plan, I was to lead the invasion force as commander of the Allied ground forces. However, the question of who would be my superior officer was still unresolved. Treatisable reporting lines. 1. Directly to the Supreme Commander. 2. To the Allied Commander-in-Chief, who would be an intermediate command authority, and 3. To the Commander of the Army Group, which was the most likely. The last option was the most feasible, since the landed troops on the enemy coast as forces accumulated were deployed into the British and American armies, which in order to ensure clear command, had to be united into a group of armies. A unified Allied command in the field was first established in Africa in January 1943, when the commanders of British and American ground forces, navy and air forces were subordinated to their respective Allied commanders-in-chief, who were Eisenhower's aides-de-camp. Alexander, to whom Montgomery was subordinate during the 8th Army's offensive from El Alamein to the Marit Line, became Eisenhower's deputy for ground forces. But since there were only two armies in Africa, united in a group, Alexander was appointed commander of the group of armies, being the commander-in-chief of the Allied ground forces only nominally. In Europe, the situation had changed radically. If in two ways in the subordination of Alexander were two small armies, in Europe, we at the end of the war, we had eight armies at the end of the war, combined into three groups of armies. In Europe, therefore, a strong argument could be made in favour of the appointment of a commander-in-chief of the land forces. Moreover, there was already a precedent in Europe for the establishment of a joint air and naval command. In Quebec, for example, the Joint Chiefs of Staff approved Air Chief Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory as Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Air Force and Admiral Bertram Ramsay as Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Naval Force. Why not, some said, complete the triumvirate by appointing a Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Land Forces? In the War Department in Washington, however, strategists approached the question practically. If there was to be a commander-in-chief of the land forces, it was desirable to appoint an American to the post, since, after all, the number of American land forces would at least three times the number of British troops. It became a matter of who to appoint to the post. At this time, no American field commander could match the authority of either Alexander or Montgomery. Leaving the question of the appointment of a commander-in-chief of the land forces, the odds were stacked against one of these British generals. We therefore tactfully kept silent on this question, relegating it to the background. Nevertheless, in England, we had a lot of trouble with the question of who would lead the Allied ground forces in the invasion of Normandy. Of course, someone in a position above the army commander of the first echelon of the invasion force had to oversee the overall planning of the troops on land, organising their interaction with the navy and air force, both during the first phase of the invasion and afterwards. Once the British troops landed on the enemy coast will be deployed to the army, I will remain only the commander of the American troops and the bridgehead will be divided into two independent areas between two equal in Wright's army commanders. It is clear that the operational leadership of them should have been united in the same hands. Such a person was undoubtedly to be the commander of the group of armies, at least until the arrival on the coast of the supreme commander of the Allied forces. I never for a moment doubted that the command of this group of armies should belong to the British. Not only was the prestige of the British at this period of the war higher than ours, but the 21st Army Group was already included in the plans of Cossack. This, however, was not, as some Americans thought, proof of British sagacity. The British were simply earlier than the Americans in taking practical steps. In the early summer of 1943, 
when Devers was besieging the War Office with requests to organize an American Army Group, the headquarters of the 21st British Army Group was already located in London. By the time the embryonic headquarters of the American Army Group was still taking possession of the Brinston Square building, the headquarters of the British Army Group had already become fully involved, under the direction of Cossack, in the planning and preparation of the invasion. Even in the late autumn of 1943, we had not yet overcome the difficulties arising from the belated organization of the American Army Group headquarters. Meanwhile, the question of command still hung in the air. The only copy of the order stamped top secret on my appointment as commander of the 1st American Army Group was in my safe. This appointment was apparently made for planning purposes only. It was assumed that the post of commander of the group of armies will take Devers. I was to command the 1st Army. Only in November, after the return of General Morgan from the United States to England, we received a decision on the command structure of the ground forces. This decision was reported in a directive of the 21st Army Group dated 29 November. The decision stated that the commander of the 21st British Army Group would take the lead in planning all land operations and would supervise British and American ground forces during the invasion. However, he would serve as Allied commander temporarily until the Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force directed the 1st American Army Group to assume command of American field forces in France. At this stage of the campaign, the temporary post of Commander-in-Chief of Allied Ground Forces held by Montgomery was abolished, and Montgomery became commander of the 21st Army Group, which combined British and Canadian troops. From that point until the end of the war, the commanders of the British and American Army Groups were on equal footing and reported directly to Eisenhower. The Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Forces was the highest headquarters for both ground forces and naval and air forces. This organization of command ensured that we had equal rights with the British in matters of strategy when fighting in Europe. We were very busy in the autumn of 1943 planning the invasion operation, but we did not have much organization in our work. Although Morgan vigorously exercised his rights as chief of staff to the supreme commander, the planning of the operation could not be sufficiently successful until a supreme commander was appointed. The question of a candidate for supreme commander of the invasion of France had been studied since the Casablanca meeting in January 1943. At that time, the invasion was planned to take place in 1943, and it was assumed that the operation would involve mainly the British. For these reasons, the conference decided that an Englishman should be appointed supreme commander. When the invasion was later postponed to 1944, the invasion force became dominated by American troops made possible by the vast manpower resources of the United States. Churchill remained true to his statement at Casablanca and suggested that an American be appointed as supreme commander. At Quebec, he suggested to Roosevelt that General Marshall be appointed to the post. General Marshall, more than anyone else, deserved the appointment. However, there is a hierarchy in the army, and the appointment of General Marshall, who is chief of staff of the army, the supreme commander would actually mean his demotion. But even without considering this, if General Marshall had left Washington for Europe, no one, not even Eisenhower, could have replaced him as Army Chief of Staff. In the Army, we often laugh at the myth of irreplaceable people. We always say that Arlington Cemetery is filled with irreplaceable men. General Marshall, however, was an exception. If there was ever an indispensable man in a time of national crisis, Marshall was that man in the United States. The final decision to keep General Marshall in the country was Roosevelt's. In turn, General Marshall, with his characteristic soldierly discipline, refrained from expressing his opinion on which of the two posts he would prefer to hold. This decision, Roosevelt, was due to the fact that only General Marshall could so decisively distribute human and material resources between the European and Pacific theaters of war. Despite the requests of MacArthur and the naval commanders, General Marshall never compromised and never abandoned his firm belief that to win the war we must first win in Europe. Usually the course of history depends on outstanding individuals who, by their persistence, endurance and courage, change events in the direction they want them to go and thereby determine the fate of others. Among the Western Allies, three such giants towered above all others in the Second World War. They were Roosevelt, Churchill and Marshall. Together, they probably influenced the fate of more people than any other triumvirate in human history. When the question of General Marshall fell away, the next possible candidate for supreme commander was a man who had held a similar position in the Mediterranean theater of war, 
Having defeated the fascist forces in Tunisia and Sicily, Eisenhower was now making his way up the Apennine Peninsula in the difficult conditions of the winter campaign. Ike was in every way suited for the position of supreme commander, for he was experienced, tactical, and a very capable officer, although some American officers believed that he was too easy to compromise, especially in Anglo-American disputes. Eisenhower and the experience of fighting in the Mediterranean Sea showed that compromise is necessary to unite the efforts of the Allies in the fight against the enemy. I myself at times it seemed to me that Eisenhower tried too hard to please the British command. I must confess, however, that I was biased in my judgment. Since I myself was an American commander, then during arguments with the British more often became on the American point of view. In early December, Eisenhower learned from President Roosevelt that in Cairo, it was decided to appoint him supreme commander of the Operation Overlord. Before the start of the invasion was only six months, so like rushed to organize the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, staffing it with officers of the headquarters in the Mediterranean theater operations. Eisenhower, at the crossing of the English Channel, more than ever needed an experienced and well-trained staff. Eisenhower took as his deputy a first-rate aviation commander in the Mediterranean, a taciturn Englishman always with a pipe in his teeth, Air Chief Marshal Ted earned the trust and affection of his American counterparts in Africa by his modesty, skill, and discretion. An unobtrusive man, Ted o was Eisenhower's right-hand man and assisted him in organizing successful air operations in the Mediterranean. Eisenhower appointed as his chief of staff very energetic and efficient Beadle Smith, who had previously held a similar post under him at the Allied headquarters in Caserta. Since arriving in England in 1942, they had become inseparable partners. They were not overly dependent on each other, but their relationship became so intertwined that it was difficult to distinguish where Ike ended and Bedell Smith began. Unlike the polite and courteous Eisenhower, Smith could be rude and abrupt. But during the diplomatic crisis that sometimes occurred at the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, he could be, like his superior, eloquent and expressive, ambiguous and restrained. Bedell tell them to get out of here. Eisenhower once said, referring to some mission that had arrived at the Supreme Headquarters, but do it in such a way that they are not offended. Eisenhower usually treated everyone equally, was rarely harsh with staff officers. Smith, on the other hand, was considerably rougher than his superior. Bedell's unique abilities as Chief of Staff gave Eisenhower the opportunity to be away from headquarters, more often and spend most of his time planning and staying with the troops. Smith possessed judgment, willpower, and initiative and was therefore able to make decisions on his own, without bothering Eisenhower for trifles, except for some of the most important issues. He was a remarkable combination of initiative and self-control, which are so important in the work of the Chief of Staff. First, the commander of the 21st Army Group, Eisenhower, decided to appoint his good friend and comrade-in-arms in Tunisia, General Alexander. Alexander participated with Eisenhower in the fighting in Tunisia, Sicily and Italy where he commanded a group of armies that included the armies of Clark and Montgomery. The friendship between Eisenhower and Alexander began in February 1943, when Alexander left his post as commander of British forces in the Middle East to join Eisenhower in Algeria, where he spent the last four months of the Tunisia campaign in command of the 18th Army Group. Here he displayed great tactical skill that later made him one of the most distinguished generals in Europe. He kept nationalistic tendencies and jealous suspicion from developing among his subordinate allied officers. By the autumn of 1943, with Tunisia, Sicily and then Salerno under his belt, Alexander held an exceptional position among the Allied High Command. He was our only and therefore most experienced Army Group commander. At the same time, he demonstrated incomparable skill in uniting the efforts of the two Allied armies to achieve a common goal. Had Alexander commanded the 21st Army Group in Europe, we might have been able to avoid the irritation that marred our later relationship with Montgomery. Unlike the extremely overconfident General Montgomery, Alexander displayed the prudence, patience and modesty that distinguish a great commander. In every campaign in the Mediterranean, he won the admiration of his subordinate Americans. By nature reserved, modest, modest, I punctual soldier, Alexander did not particularly resent the fact that the honours at the end of the campaign went not to him and subordinate commanders. So soon, therefore, the figure of Barnard Montgomery in a Barreto shadowed Alexander. However, while Montgomery appeared on the scene as a symbol of England's resurgence in the war, the Allies, who knew both generals, 
valued Alexander much more highly as a commander. Although I did not realise it at the time, the British rejected Eisenhower's request to appoint Alexander and suggested that he be left in Italy to intensify military action on the peninsula. The British refusal forced Eisenhower to settle on Montgomery's candidacy. My acquaintance with Montgomery by this time was limited to two brief meetings. The first time we met in Tunisia, when he came to receive the parade of our troops to celebrate the victory, and the second time in Sicily, when he hosted a breakfast in honour of the completion of the campaign on that island. It was therefore as yet difficult for me to judge of him as a military commander. For this reason alone I would have preferred to have Alexander rather than Montgomery as commander of the 21st Army Group. Since I knew Montgomery only through the legends that were told about him, I was convinced that with Alexander I would work more calmly and coherently. However, I had little difficulty in dealing with Montgomery in Europe. Although we often disagreed over plans and tactics, our business relationship was never strained, and in personal contacts we did not drag each other down. Perhaps my assessment of Montgomery's achievements is less enthusiastic than that of the British people, but I will never diminish Montgomery's commanding skills and his outstanding role in the war. Lonti's incomparable talent for organising a classic battle, that is, a carefully prepared offensive, made him invaluable in the invasion of France. The crossing of the Channel had to be conducted strictly according to plan, chance and improvisation in the management of troops was excluded. Until the troops had established themselves on the bridgehead, we pinned all our hopes on the plan. It was not until seven weeks after the landing, when we began the offensive from the captured bridgehead, that the favourable situation required us to be able to quickly build on our success, which was a test of our command's ability to ensure continuous management of the troops. In the rapidly changing environment that characterised the very end of the war, Montgomery's glory faded somewhat, not because of his indecision, as some critics claim, but because of his apparent unwillingness to exploit to the end of the advantages that were created by our successes at the front. Monty insisted that the troops advance along the entire front evenly, even if this required slowing the pace of the offensive. On the contrary, the Americans preferred to advance rapidly, without restraining the initiative of troops in the pursuit, in order not to give the enemy the opportunity to gain a foothold in the intermediate lines, to stabilise the front line. For the stabilisation of the front line would mean that it would be necessary to break the enemy's defence again, and this could lead to unnecessary losses and slow down the pace of the offensive. Psychologically, Montgomery's appointment as commander of the British invasion troops across the Channel had an encouraging effect on all of us. Skinny, bony face ascetic over a high collar jumper non military sample in less than a year has become a symbol of victory in the eyes of the entire Allied camp. Nothing makes a general so famous as success in battle, and Montgomery succeeded with such faith in the power of British arms that the English people, tired of countless defeats, almost deified him. Nowhere thin, straight figure Montgomery and Baggy and unearned jacket did not inspire such confidence as among British soldiers. Even Eisenhower, for all his simplicity of address, could never arouse such enthusiasm among American soldiers with which the British soldiers greeted Monty. Among these men, the legend of Montgomery became an unquestioned truth. Montgomery appointed a jovial Huguenot, Major General Francis de Gingan of the 8th Army, as Chief of Staff of the 21st Army Group. Like Bedell Smith, de Guignan was an excellent staffer, characterised by modesty and dedication. However, de Guignan complemented the qualities of his superior to a much greater extent than Bedell Smith. In the person of Freddy, as the Americans lovingly nicknamed de Guignan, we found a good mediator and peacemaker. When Montgomery's arrogance began to irritate the American staff, on the scene appeared nice and cheerful friend Freddy, settled differences. De Guignan, an able cadre soldier, had been Montgomery's chief of staff since El Alain. He was an experienced and sympathetic administrator, responding in a timely manner and never losing his composure of spirit in the face of the difficulties of war. Although Freddy's popularity among American officers was due in part to his ability to forge good relations between Americans and British, he was unfailingly loyal and faithful to his superior. De Guignan won our affection not because he flattered us, but because he helped to resolve our differences with his characteristic fairness and prudence. At the same time, Montgomery took to himself Lieutenant General Miles Dempsey, whom he held in high esteem as a corps commander in the 8th Army. Dempsey was appointed commander of the 2nd British Army, landing in France in conjunction with the 1st American Army. In Dempsey, Montgomery found an able and experienced commander who, 
while quite competent to command an army, at the same time did not object to Monty's habit of usurping the occasional authority of his army commanders. Montgomery was so jealous of the execution of his elaborate plans that he often interfered rather rudely in the management of the troops, something that would never have been tolerated in the American army. However, Montgomery and Dempsey are so accustomed to each other that this interference did not cause objection to Dempsey. The latter knew how to suppress feelings of resentment or indignation. Had Montgomery also interfered in the functions of American officers subordinate to him, we would have protested strongly, for we would never have relinquished the traditional autonomy in the conduct of operations, which is given to us by the directives of the high command. Monty recognized the existence of this distinction and therefore was never picky about the operations we conducted. Before leaving the Mediterranean theater of operations in England to direct the planning of the invasion across the channel, Eisenhower reviewed the lists of senior American commanders to find a replacement for his successor in this theater, British General Maitland Wilson. Wilson's deputy would have to deal mainly with administrative matters, as he was given responsibility for the material support of Clark's Fifth Army. Thus, if this position did not require an experienced combat general, it nevertheless needed someone capable of handling complex administrative matters. Devers would be most suitable for the position. Upon Eisenhower's arrival in England, Devers automatically vacated the post of commander in the European Theater of Operations. By becoming supreme commander of the Allied forces, General Eisenhower would at the same time be commander of American forces in the European Theater. On 23 December 1943, Eisenhower radioed General Marshall at headquarters in the Mediterranean that he recommended that I be appointed commander of the ground forces for the invasion across the Channel, and that Devers be sent south as Jumbo Wilson's deputy. Eisenhower had earmarked me for the post of commander of the American Army Group, apparently because he considered my combat experience so necessary in planning a major amphibious operation. This recommendation meant that I had to command the 1st American Army Group, not only during the planning of the operation, but also after its landing on the coast of France. Command of Army Group, however, did not mean that I would be relieved of command of the 1st Army during the invasion. On the contrary, I was to supervise the landing and the concentration of the forces of the 1st Army on the bridgehead. When a force equal in size to the two armies would be landed on the enemy's coast, I was to surrender command of the 1st Army and become commander of the Army Group uniting the two armies. Up to that point, I had been both commander of the 1st American Army and commander of the 1st American Army Group. In fact, dual command was not as complicated as it might seem at first glance, as each headquarters worked on its own set of issues. The 1st Army headquarters was in Bristol, and the Army Group headquarters was in London, meaning they were nearly 200 kilometers apart and worked completely independently. Management of all American invasion forces was concentrated in the headquarters of the 1st Army. At this time, the Army Group headquarters existed only as a planning body. However, despite some confusion, this dual command system had many advantages, as it allowed to organize excellent continuity in the work of the Army and Army Group headquarters. According to the plan, the headquarters of the 1st Army was responsible for the transfer of troops to the enemy's coast during the first two weeks after the landing, then reinforcements were sent by the Army Group. Since the Army Group headquarters was deployed immediately after the Army headquarters was rolled up for forward redeployment, it was natural that if there was one person at the head of the Army and the Army Group, he could better organize their interaction. The appointment as commander of a group of armies was unexpected for me, and I learned about it by chance in the morning newspaper. On 18 January, I was passing through the lobby of the Hotel Dorchester, going to the dining room for breakfast. On the way I stopped to buy the Daily Express, then a four-page newspaper. The newsagent smiled at the sight of me. It's not news to you, sir, he said, pointing to an article in the paper in which General Eisenhower announced that 51-year-old Lieutenant General Omar Nelson Bradley, who had commanded the American Second Corps in Tunisia and Sicily, would become the American General Montgomery in the invasion of Western Europe. Still, this message turned out to be news to me. It was the first time I learned that the command of the army group was not temporary for me. Eisenhower had just arrived in England and I had not yet had time to talk to him. At a press conference held the day before immediately upon Eisenhower's arrival, he was asked who would command the American ground forces during the invasion. General Bradley will lead the United States ground forces, he replied. At first this statement was not clear enough, for Eisenhower did not specify whether he meant the First Army which landed in Normandy 
or the army group acting as the American equivalent to Montgomery's army group. Only later did Eisenhower say that he meant army group, before leaving the Mediterranean theater of operations to take up his new post in England. Having previously visited the United States, Eisenhower had studied the draft plan drawn up by Cossack for an invasion across the Channel. His dissatisfaction confirmed the negative conclusions which we had already drawn in England in familiarizing ourselves with the plan. According to the plan, there were three divisions in the first echelon of the invasion force and two divisions in the second echelon. It is evident from this that in the most crucial operation of the invasion, Cossack planned to act with a very limited force. Of course, the allocation of so few troops cannot be blamed solely on Cossack, for Morgan could not have done more than what his resources allowed. It turned out that in all other amphibious operations, Morgan was sorely deficient in landing assets from the outset. Light our amphibious assets scattered all over the world. We could spare ships to transport only five divisions. Even in 1944, the production of landing craft lagged far behind our needs. As a result, the invasion across the Channel was to be carried out with insufficient landing craft. If even the three divisions scheduled to land in the first echelon managed to gain a foothold on the coast, their bridgehead would be so limited in front that the Germans could easily throw them into the sea with a counterattack. I was extremely alarmed at the lack of amphibious assets in preparation for Operation Overlord, but was reassured by the sole consideration that as soon as the Supreme Commander learnt of the difficulties that prevented the success of the operation, he would turn heaven and earth upside down to reinforce us with amphibious assets, even at the expense of curtailing operations in the Pacific. So long as it was planned to land only three divisions on the first day of the invasion, I foresaw the difficulties which arise in capturing a large port soon after the landing. Cossack had assumed that only 26 to 30 Allied divisions would eventually be landed on the bridgehead for the material support of such a huge army. In addition to the unloading of goods on the coast, required a major port in the hands of the Allies. Therefore, after the landing, we necessarily had to expand the bridgehead and capture a major port. If we were not able to achieve this before bad weather set in the strait, then the rate of concentration of our troops on the bridgehead would be reduced. According to the Cossack plan, we landed troops on the coast, which is a considerable distance from Cherbourg preliminary planned area, for landing troops occupied a 40 kilometer stretch of pebble-covered Normandy coast, located almost midway between Le Havre and Cherbourg. Le Havre is a fine harbor, but was clearly out of our reach. The town was on the opposite bank of the broad mouth of the scene from us. The approaches to the port were covered by the guns of the coast defense. In addition, the garrison of Le Havre could easily be reinforced by German reinforcements concentrated in the area of the Pass de Calais. We believe that we will be able to capture Cherbourg without much difficulty if we bypass it from the rear. However, even here there were difficulties which caused me anxiety. Between Cherbourg and the landing site in the department of Calvados flows many rivers and streams, which cover almost the entire base of the peninsula Cotentin. If the Germans had had time to fortify this swampy base of the peninsula, then it was difficult to say when we would have succeeded in breaking through to Cherbourg. Coastal fortifications in the Cherbourg area did not give the opportunity to carry out an encompassing maneuver from the sea, so our only hope of quickly seizing the city was to simultaneously with the rest of the landing force also landed troops on the coast of the peninsula Cotantin. In this way we could hope to land a landing in the rear of the enemy's troops, which he could concentrate to hold the base of the Cotentin peninsula in order to prevent us from reaching Cherbourg. Consequently, we should have extended the landing area on the first day of Operation Overlord by using one or two more divisions for this purpose. Fortunately, Eisenhower came to a similar conclusion and ordered Montgomery to go to England and explore the possibilities of expanding the bridgehead. After spending a few days at Cossack headquarters, Monty agreed with us that it was necessary to expand the landing front to include e, the Cotentin Peninsula. Before the landing was scheduled for the coast of the Department of Calvados in Normandy, Morgan's headquarters carefully studied the coast of Europe from Holland to Spain. From the archives of their intelligence, the British extracted volumes with a detailed study of the structure of the subsoil, bridges, anchorages, ports, rivers and thousands of other issues that were taken into account when drawing up a plan for the invasion across the Channel. Characteristic of the enterprise of the British in carrying out this reconnaissance work was the answer they gave to our inquiry as to the condition of the subsoil at the Omaha landing site. 
In exploring one possible direction of advance after securing a foothold on the bridgehead, we feared that a stream flowing here might have deposited a layer of silt beneath the sand and pebbles on the coast. If our fears had been realized, the lorries could easily have become stranded on the coast when unloading from the ships. What information can you get about the subsurface conditions in this area? I asked Dixon when the operations department put the question to me. A few days later, a lean, trim British Navy lieutenant appeared at our meeting in Brinston Square. He took a thick glass pipe out of his pocket and walked with it to a map hanging on the wall. The night before last, it began in a calm tone. We visited the Omaha landing site, drilled a borehole and took a sample. As you can judge from this sample, there is not the slightest trace of silt. The pebbles are on a hard, rocky base. It's unlikely that your lorries are stuck. To get this information, the lieutenant had to use a submarine that passed through minefields off the coast of France. Then, at night, he sailed in an inflatable boat to the shore right under the muzzles of huge German guns looking out of the casemates. In studying the coast of the English Channel and the Bay of Biscay from the point of view of their suitability for landing troops, the officers of the Cossack headquarters were guided by the following consideration. 1. Could the landing area be covered by fighter aircraft based in England? 2. How many divisions could be landed on the first day of the invasion? 3. How many divisions can the enemy use against landed troops in the first week of the invasion? 4. How many warships and transport aircraft will be needed to support the landings? 5. How many tons of supplies could be delivered daily to the coast and the nearest ports? Since we knew that all the most important ports were prepared by the Germans for destruction in the event of an Allied landing, we assumed in our calculations that any port occupied by us would be seriously damaged. This meant, of course, that we had to rely on cargo and resupply being unloaded directly on the coast. Dussek headquarters therefore outlined six possible landing sites. On the Dutch and Belgian coasts of the North Sea, two in the Strait of Pass de Calais, the coast of which is under artillery fire from the Dover forts. At the mouth of the scene at Le Havre, 184, in the neighbourhood of Cayenne and the Cotentin Peninsula, on which the port of Cherbourg is situated. Like on the coast of the Brittany Peninsula, which has a large number of ports, including the German submarine base at Brest, and finally S, on the coast of the Bay of Biscay as far as Bordeaux. A landing on the German and Danish North Sea coast was rejected from the outset, as this coast was beyond the range of Allied fighters. From the very beginning of the study of possible landing sites, Four sites out of the above six were ruled out as too dangerous. The coasts of Holland and Belgium were, in our opinion, too far from the Allied fighter bases in England. Besides, there were too few roads leading inland from the coast in this area, and the soft sand dunes presented a serious obstacle to the transport of supplies. If we landed at the mouth of the Seine at Le Havre, then our troops would be in a dangerous position, being isolated from each other by the river, and the enemy could break them in pieces. In addition, the enemy's artillery could fire on them from the coastal fortifications of the port of Le Havre, and the troops landed north of the scene could be subjected to a counter-attack of the enemy from the area of Pars de Calais. And much of the coast of the Brittany Peninsula was inconvenient for landing troops because of its rocky shore. There was a large number of first-class ports, but they were protected by strong garrisons of German troops, and, in addition, the peninsula of Brittany was at a distance of more than 320 kilometres from the bases of fighter aircraft in England. The latter circumstance definitely forced to exclude this area from the number of suitable for landing. Further south, the coast of the Bay of Biscay was never considered as a possible landing site, as it was too far from the Allied fighter bases. In addition, a landing in this area would have required a long sea crossing, and this, in turn, would not give us the opportunity to use small landing craft which could be successfully used in crossing the English Channel. All these possible landing sites were quickly excluded from the plan and began a detailed study of the remaining two sites. The first site, the coast of the Pass de Calais Strait, was only 30 kilometres from Dover. When the Germans concentrated in the area of Pass de Calais troops and dressed in concrete Atlantic rampart, it became obvious that the enemy expects the Allied offensive here. Therefore, this option of landing fell away, the last remaining section of the landing covered a coastline of 100 kilometres. It ran from Cayenne through the Carantana estuary almost to Cherbourg. From the enemy's point of view, this remote provincial stretch of coast 
320 kilometers from Paris and 640 kilometers from the Siegfried Line, was a less tempting target for an Allied invasion than the coast of the Pass de Calais. As a result, here the Germans almost did not build fortifications, and only shortly before the landing began to strengthen the area on the orders of Hitler, who felt that the Allies could land here. Not to mention the fact that the coast at Cayenne was poorly fortified, this area was favorable for us also, because it was located at a considerable distance from the reserves and bases of the enemy. At the same time, the coast at Caen was an ideal place for landing troops. The coast, it is true, was not sheltered from the winds, but it was not as open as that off the Pass de Calais. Although there were not as many roads inland from the coast as we wished, the few roads we could use were in good condition. In addition, this section of Normandy was covered from the Pass de Calais, Belgium, and Holland by a water barrier such as the Seine. In the case of destruction of Allied aircraft, bridges across the Seine could delay the transfer of enemy reinforcements, from this in fact, and depended on whether the invasion will be successful or the German troops dumped us in the strait. Favorable conditions that were created for us, due to the difficulties of the enemy to transfer reserves across the Seine, were so significant that justified our choice of landing site at Cal When landing in the area of KN aircraft had to fly further to the bridgehead, and therefore they could stay in the air over the landing site for less time. Although this made it difficult to provide air cover for the landing troops, it was still sufficiently reliable. So of the 190 airfields available in England, almost one-third were within a radius of up to 246 kilometers of the bridgehead, with most of the other airfields also quite close. In other words, a landing in the KN area would have required no more cover effort from Allied aircraft than the guarding of New York by fighters based at airfields in Baltimore. The invasion of the KN area lengthened the crossing of the strait somewhat compared with the landing on the Pass de Calais coast. But this longer route was far better than the invasion across the Pass de Calais strait at the muzzles of German guns. By the time of Eisenhower's arrival in England on 15 January 1944, Montgomery was already waiting for him with his proposals to strengthen the first echelon of troops crossing the English Channel and to use the Cotentin Peninsula for landing troops also. I was relieved because the landing of five divisions in the first echelon and two divisions in the second echelon gave the opportunity to break through both in the area of Cayenne and the Cotentin Peninsula. It was now possible to capture Cherbourg with a minimum loss of time and the wide front of the landing gave us the opportunity to find a weak spot in the enemy's defence in order to break through it. A week later, on 23 January, Eisenhower first gathered the top officers of the Allied Expeditionary Force at the historic Norfolk House in London, where King George I.I. was born. In addition to Tedder, Montgomery, Smith and myself, Allied Air Force Commander-in-Chief Lee Mallory and Fleet Commander-in-Chief Ramsay were invited. Torrey Spatz also attended the meeting, although as Commander of Strategic Aviation he did not yet report to Ike. Spatz received orders directly from the Joint Chiefs of Staff, except for special assignments. Eisenhower approved Montgomery's proposals to expand the landing front and immediately put Washington on the need to bring the number of landing troops to five divisions. With a smaller force, he said, cannot count on success. Although the landing of five divisions required more amphibious assets, Eisenhower did not want to postpone the invasion to a later date and change the already scheduled date of early May. He wanted to use the entire summer period for campaigns before bad weather set in. Nevertheless, Eisenhower recognized that increasing the scale of the operation might cause it to be postponed because of a lack of amphibious assets. Eisenhower believed that if the increased requirements could not be met by increased production, then the necessary ships should be taken from the reserve set aside to support other amphibious operations. Five weeks earlier in Cairo, when the Joint Chiefs of Staff were considering sources of landing assets for the planned invasion of southern France, he had naturally counted on our resources in the Pacific. Admiral King, however, flatly refused to accede to the committee's request. He thought it wrong to consider naval forces in the Pacific as a reserve for the war in Europe. However, ships had to be sought, no matter how strong the desire of the naval commanders to wage war in the Pacific. The decision of Roosevelt and Churchill to crush Germany first was binding on him. The Allies planned in Europe, in addition to the main Operation Overlord, another operation of a diversionary nature, an invasion of southern France from the Mediterranean Sea. This operation was given the conventional name Enville, which was later changed to Dragoon. According to the invasion plan, on the coast of southern France should have landed only two divisions, 
but even for these forces required a huge amount of landing gear. Meanwhile, Eisenhower had already outlined the landing in the area of Anzio to bypass the sea stabized front in Italy, when Eisenhower was still in the United States, where he stopped by on his way from the Mediterranean theater of operations to England. He was warned by Montgomery and Smith that to ensure the landing in Normandy five divisions would have to take ships intended for the invasion of southern France. They recommended that the force landing in southern France be reduced to one division and that the freed ships be moved to England to support the invasion across the Channel. Eisenhower, however, did not agree to this. He sought at all costs to conduct a landing in southern France, if only at the cost of delaying the invasion across the Channel for a month. In turn, I wholeheartedly wished that the landing in southern France was landed, although the cancellation of the Operation Envil would have greatly alleviated the difficulties facing me in preparing the invasion across the Channel, in connection with the fact that the aircraft more and more destroyed the railway network of France. It became obvious those difficulties that will arise in the work of the rear during the offensive Allied troops in France. Landing in the south of this country would not only lead to the expulsion of the Germans from the southern part of France, but would also provide an opportunity to create a new supply route from Marseilles to Alsace along the Rhone River Valley. Throughout the winter and early spring of 1944, the feasibility of Operation Anvil was constantly questioned. Its implementation was hampered not only by the lack of ships in connection with the preparation of the invasion across the English Channel, but also revealed differences between the Americans and the British regarding the assessment of this operation. For American strategists, landing in southern France was an integral part of our strategy in Europe, pursuing the goal of pincer German troops in France. Meanwhile, the British denied any strategic significance of this operation. For them, the landing in southern France was nothing more than just a diversionary tactical maneuver. They considered this operation desirable but not necessary. This attitude of the British undoubtedly influenced the protracted campaign in Italy. The landing at Anzio on 22 January caused great disappointment. Under the circumstances, they were inclined to ask, will not the Operation Anvil to excessive depletion of our manpower in the Mediterranean Sea? In London, the last weeks before the operation passed with terrifying rapidity, in connection with the Allied desire to use the ships allocated to the Operation Envil in the Operation Overlord, as well as in connection with the failure of the landing in the area of Anzio Eisenhower persuaded, and he himself was already inclined to abandon the Operation Envil. Nevertheless, he did not leave the faint hope that it will be possible to carry out both operations. The Supreme Headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force tried to find a way out of the situation, offering to load the ships over the established norm. However, Montgomery and I objected, as overloading the ships could create disorder when landing on the shore. In planning Operation Overlord, we observed the principle that each ship should be loaded with a combat unit together with its armament and ammunition. If we had violated this principle, the landing would have taken a long time for the troops to sort out into units, which could have led to serious difficulties. Stop playing hide and seek. I said to Keane, we can't go round and round on the question of tonnage any longer. If we have to abandon the landing in southern France, it would be better to do so than to violate the order we have established for loading troops on ships. The decision to abandon the landing in southern France was finally taken on 21 March, when the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force found out that the ships to ensure the Operation Overlord is not enough. Eisenhower realized that the delay is no longer possible. Extremely reluctantly, he offered to postpone the landing in southern France until after the invasion across the Channel. In late January 1944, it was decided to postpone the Channel invasion from early May to June. When Eisenhower discovered shortly after he arrived in England that landing craft were in short supply, he showed great nervousness as the day of the invasion approached. On 24 January, outlining his thoughts on extending the landing front in the invasion across the Channel, Eisenhower reported to the War Department that from the Army's point of view, it is more advantageous to conduct the operation in May. However, in the same report, Eisenhower pointed out, rather than expose myself to the risk of carrying out the operation with a small force, I would prefer to postpone it for a month to concentrate the necessary number of troops. The British Chiefs of Staff, also alarmed by this time threatening shortage of ships, supported Eisenhower's proposal to postpone the invasion, and on 31 January they were joined by the American Chiefs of Staff, understandably, 
I was also in favor of delaying the invasion until we were supplied with additional landing craft. However, I still found it difficult to understand why, in conducting this most decisive offensive operation of the entire war, we had to compete with action in the Pacific when our most urgent needs were at stake. Artillery support by naval ships for Operation Overlord was planned on the same scale as for operations in the Pacific. I had no idea of the effort the Navy was making in the Pacific theater, but I was irritated by the Navy's tendency to view Operation Overlord as a European stepchild. Our air forces welcomed the decision to delay the invasion across the Channel for a full month. The extra few weeks gave them the opportunity to continue suppressing the enemy from the air. Even the Russians, who were far away from us, welcomed the postponement of the invasion. The soil on the Eastern Front would have dried up by June, and this would have given the Red Army the opportunity to resume the offensive. Even before Montgomery arrived in England, the British headquarters of the 21st Army Group began a long and detailed planning of various aspects of the invasion, which later became part of the Operation Overlord plan. The headquarters' first document was the so-called Initial Joint Plan. This plan was developed by the 21st Army Group headquarters in conjunction with the headquarters of the landing armies, and it set out the tasks of the armies once they landed on the coast. Based on the plan, each army developed its own order, which was the basic document for the actions of the corps of the 1st Echelon of the Army. The 1st Echelon divisions then developed their detailed plans under the supervision of the corps commander. The plan then travelled down from division to regiment, from regiment to battalion, and finally reached company commanders in the form of a combat order. To draw up the initial joint, plan the headquarters of the 21st Army Group organized special planning groups, called syndicates, each tasked with developing a particular phase of the invasion. The syndicates, or committees, were composed of representatives from the headquarters of Montgomery's Army Group, Dempsey's British Second Army, and my First American Army. In addition, each syndicate was represented by the Air Force. The Navy, the supreme headquarters of the Allied Expeditionary Force, the British government, the headquarters of the European Theatre of Operations, and the headquarters of the General Army Formations. After six weeks' work by these syndicates, a joint plan was drawn up, which we approved. Although the British on many issues argued with us during the meetings, they did not abuse the relationship that had developed between us. For the most part, the English officers were senior to us in rank. By the job, that was the way it was supposed to be. Most of them were more familiar with the invasion plan than we were. This was mainly due to the fact that they had already been involved in invasion planning for many months before we became involved. While the headquarters of the First Army was busy in daily meetings in the Syndicate, a special group was assigned from the headquarters of the First Army Group and attached to Montgomery's headquarters. Here they worked out a plan with the British to move reinforcements to the Allied bridgehead in France. The First Army was responsible for reinforcing the landed American troops during the first 14 days of the invasion. After that, the American Army Group headquarters was responsible for moving reinforcements. At first I believed that Army Group headquarters could limit itself to a small number of officers engaged in high-level planning and did not want to swell the staff, which is common in higher headquarters. However, Army Group headquarters had not been in existence for three months, when Chief of Staff Montgomery had already requested that 14 engineering officers be assigned to 21st Army Group headquarters. At this time, we had only three such officers at Brinston Square. After that, I wavered and did not prevent Army Group headquarters from swelling. Shortly after the end of the war, while in Wiesbaden, I was amazed to learn that the Army Group headquarters and its special units numbered over 900 officers. This exceeded the number of officers of a division fully manned with infantry. The monstrous increase in the personnel of the Army Group headquarters horrified me, but the Deputy Chief of Staff calmed me down by informing me that usually 1,100 packets of correspondence passed through the headquarters per day. Meanwhile, no more than 30 documents were reported to me daily. Since most of the higher headquarters were located in London, this noisy, crowded city became the centre of Allied planning. In December, the British suggested that we move the 1st Army headquarters from Bristol to London, co-locating it with the other headquarters. However, instead of moving the entire headquarters, I moved only the officers engaged in planning to London. This group of 30 officers was headed by Bill Keane. They were located in the vacant rooms placed at their disposal by the headquarters of our group of armies in Bryanston Square. The 1st Army Headquarters Operations Room was located on the first floor of the brick building occupied by Army Group Headquarters.
This building was part of an ensemble of fashionable West End flats with Italian marble fireplaces, Rococo stucco ceilings, and a picturesque view of the shady boulevard that stretched along the entire block. The windows were draped with heavy light masking curtains day and night. The living room was filled with role-playing desks, the walls hung with top-secret maps. The maps were covered with sheets of tracing paper on which were drawn delimitation lines, objects, intermediate lines, that is, those secrets for which the enemy would willingly sacrifice several divisions. In one corner of the living room Dixon located the intelligence department. On the maps, conventional signs of red colour were marked firing positions and guns of the enemy. Arcs were drawn from the coast of France, occupied by the enemy, to show the range of the guns of the coastal defences, the sectors of gunfire overlapping one another and almost entirely covering the channel. At the end of the crowded room, the huge Tubby Thorson, whose name was often confused, headed the operations department. Here, two sergeants retyped on typewriters the combat schedules of troops, which changed daily. Each unit list took 25 to 30 pages, as it was necessary to list the 1,400 or more American formations, units and units that landed in Normandy in the first two weeks of the invasion. The entrance to the living room was guarded by military police around the clock. Before ringing the bell to open the door from the inside, a policeman checked a special pass for each person entering. Whoever had such a pass was allowed to access any secret documents that were in the European theatre of war. The pass gave access to all the details of the invasion, including the day of the landing. During one of the German air raids at night, several incendiary bombs fell on Brinston Square. Fire broke out in some of the buildings occupied by us. One of the magnesium bombs penetrated the roof and fell on the floor of my office. Fortunately, it did not explode. Volunteers with water cannons rushed in from the street to put out the fires, and our security cordon was broken. Luckily for us, however, the sentry at the door of the operations room stayed at his post and secrets were kept. If the operations room had burned down, then thousands of hours spent in planning would have been irretrievably lost. Even more terrible was the danger of disclosure in the resulting turmoil of the materials in the operations room. Of all the military secrets, we were most careful to preserve the date of the invasion. Although counterintelligence agents at our headquarters checked desks and safes at night, in an effort to discover violations of military secrecy instructions, only one serious violation was discovered during the entire period that the date of the invasion remained a great secret. This was at the end of April 1944, when Brigadier General Edwin Seibert, the calm and extremely capable Chief of Intelligence of Army Group Headquarters, entered my office in Brinston Square on the morning of the invasion. General, he began, I should not like to report to you on this case. What business? I asked. Seibert explained. The previous evening he had attended a dinner at Claridge's with an American Major General and a group of Allied officers. Cocktails were served before dinner. Complaining of supply difficulties, the Major General said that some acutely scarce supplies would not be delivered to England until after the invasion, and the invasion, he added meaningfully, would take place before the 15th of June. I had known the General since we were cadets at West Point. I respected him and valued my friendship with him, but I had no choice. I called Dyke. Immediately, an investigation took place confirming the general's guilt. He was suspended within 24 hours, reduced in rank to colonel, and sent to the United States. Counterintelligence agents suggested to those who had attended the dinner with him at Claridge's that they keep their mouths shut. This warning may have been unnecessary, for they were all terribly frightened. Some officers later claimed that Ike had been unduly harsh, but I did not share their view. If I had been in Eisenhower's shoes, I would have done the same thing. Although the incident had no consequences, the punishment showed that no one can be privileged when it comes to people's lives. At the same time, it convinced the British that we would not allow any chatter. Of all the plans for the invasion, each headquarters drew up its own plans. The most complex, the most detailed and elaborate were the plans for the First Echelon Army, when on 25 February 1944, we completed the Channel Invasion Plan for the First Army and stitched it together with the Corps' plans. We had a huge rotary printed volume with more words than Marguerite Mitchell's Gone with the Wind. In all, the First Army printed 324 copies of this secret document. On the first day of the invasion alone, the First Army landed troops on the enemy coast that would require more than 200 troop echelons. Two weeks after the invasion began, 
the Americans were concentrating in France an army twice the size of the American army at the beginning of World War II, that is, in 1939. Within two weeks of the breakthrough of the German defences, we had concentrated in Normandy so many vehicles that if they were lined up in two columns, they would stretch from Pittsburgh to Chicago. On the American section of the bridgehead landed more than 55,000 people. The landing included 200 different individual formations, units and units ranging from a division of 14,000 men to a two-man photographic team. Each man, each vehicle became part of a gigantic mechanism that had to be disassembled before crossing the channel and reassembled on the opposite shore. We carried equipment and materials from 36-metre long steel bridge trusses to sulfidine tablets. We even took drinking water with us, over 1,200,000 litres for the first three days after landing. On the head of the operations department, Thorson, and the head of the logistics department, Wilson, had the heavy task of determining the order of loading cargo on the ships. Thorson was responsible for loading combat vehicles and personnel, while Wilson was responsible for loading supplies and service units. After a month, both were fatigued to the extreme, for it was almost impossible to find a man who was not convinced that if he was not landed on the coast on the day of the invasion, the entire Operation Overlord would be thwarted. In order to provide places for troops, services and reinforcements, it was necessary to reduce the transport carried in all units and formations of the first echelon to the absolutely necessary minimum. As a result, even the first division was forced to leave in the rear more than half of its regular transport. When one of the division's officers complained about this, Tubby snapped back. Look, mate, you're not going to get very far on the first day of the invasion anyway. If you get stuck for lack of transport, then let me know and I'll carry you to Paris on my back. Even the mild and harmless Wilson was driven to the point of being rude when a civil affairs officer demanded space on ships to carry food for the French on the first day of the invasion. Wilson stared at him in amazement across a table littered with urgent demands for ammunition, fuel and bridge equipment. Is the delivery of this food so important? he asked. Absolutely, sir, the officer replied. Excellent, Wilson said. Now listen carefully. You will get the necessary tonnage but you will land the day before the invasion. Not a soul will disturb you on the coast. There you can feed all the French you can find, and the next morning you can wave your flag at us as we begin our landing. This trick, offering to land the day before the invasion, was always at Wilson's ready. He considered it the most persuasive argument he had ever had at his disposal.